Want to young Turks? This show uh, is a little too big, okay? You've slipped into uh, a show that is going to overwhelm you a little bit. A little bit later on the program, Indian toilets. Should we do them or not do them? Think about it. Okay. All right, look, it's a wild, wild show. Uh, let me tell you, just tell you about the guests real quick. They're coming up in this hour. One, uh-oh, we got another conservative, and he thinks we should start the next American Revolution or civil war or something, some sort of war, civil war, okay. All right, so that ought to be interesting. That's coming up in a little bit. And then two giant libs have gone to war with one another. So I got something here. Glenn Greenwald on one side, Larry Lessig on the other. You know what this is, by the way? That's that Monday Night Football graphic that they used to have. Do they still have that? Where the helmets crash and they go when all my rowdy friends are here uh, to stop uh, mining regulations. I'm never going to let that go, man. That Hank Williams Jr., he did us wrong. All right, anyway, uh, so uh, Glenn Greenwald's on the program. One of those warriors is going to come on and tell us what's wrong with Alana Kagan. That ought to be a very interesting interview. Uh, and then uh, at some point in today's show, I have an interesting fact. I have an interesting fact about... Taxes. There, I said it. Yeah, it's an interesting fact about taxes. Let's see if I can meet that challenge. Has anyone ever had an interesting fact about taxes? If they do, it's on this program. All right. Now, I got a million and a half news, but you know what I'm starting with? I'm starting with Bradley Byrne. A guy in, uh, in Alabama switched from being a Democrat to a Republican. Why did he do that? Because he used to vote with the Republicans almost all the time anyway. Finally gave up pre pretenses. This guy, I, I know this guy, is deeply conservative. Deeply, okay? But apparently, for the Republicans in Alabama, not conservative enough. So they're going to run this very amusing ad against him. Let's go to clip number eight. Bradley Byrne was a Democrat. Now he's a Republican. On the school board, Byrne supported teaching evolution, said evolution best explains the origin of life, even recently said the Bible is only partially true. Candidate Byrne changed his tune. Legislator Byrne voted to raise property taxes, income taxes, the sales tax, and even tax health insurance premiums. Byrne claims he won't do it again. Bradley Byrne, another liberal blowing in the wind. Trying to look conservative. Oh, I love that ad. I love Bradley Byrne believes in evolution. Goddamn liberal. You know that he believes that the Bible is only partially true? You know what I love to ask people whenever they say that? So you believe that uh, eating shrimp is an abomination against God, right? Because that's in the Bible. I always come back to that. Why? Because Americans love shrimp. So now you tell me, is it an abomination or it's not an abomination? Wait, if it's not an abomination and your fat ass keeps eating shrimp down in Alabama, well then, okay, I guess it's not the inerrant word of God, right? Perhaps you could have a discussion about whether it's partially true or not. But, I mean, but put that aside, I just love their attack on him. Bradley Byrne believes in facts. Bradley Byrne believes that the number seven comes after six. And before eight, goddamn liberal, Bradley Byrne believes that there are no such thing as dragons. Well, how do you explain the dragons in Revelations, you dumbass lib? Bradley Byrne believes three plus three equals six. Well, that's a number, son. We don't believe in numbers in Alabama. We're real conservatives, you goddamn lib. <laughs> Look, if anything, for the first time ever, that ad would make me consider voting for Bradley Byrne, which I never would have before. But I love that they're so proud of their ignorance. All right, that might be a theme I might return to on this show. Bradley Byrne, goddamn liberal. <laughs> All right. So, now, that was my uh, first fun thing for you guys. Now, um, you know, we talked about Alana Kagan yesterday. We're going to talk more with Glenn. Uh, but, of course, I, I, I blogged it out yesterday. And uh, I, I got some heat for it. Uh, you're shocked by that, right? Everybody's surprised by that. Uh, because in my blog, and as you heard on the show, 
uh, I said that the problem, the real problem with Alana Kagan was Barack Obama, that he likes to concede too much. And so he picked someone who is a centrist. Uh, and, you know, I don't have a problem with that, but if you're a real progressive and you thought you elected a progressive president, well, then you might not be that happy about it. But I'm a judicial moderate. Uh, and now, it, as it turns out, look, what makes me a judicial moderate? We'll go over this real quick again, okay? Look, I don't think that the right of privacy exists. So th actually, that makes me screaming right winger judicially in a lot of ways, okay? So, and a lot of progressives would hate it, et cetera, right? But Obama shouldn't put me on the Supreme Court either. Now, on other stuff, I'm a very much a progressive on judicial matters. Uh, executive uh, power and First Amendment issues, etc. Now, unfortunately, Kagan's not that good on those issues, and, or at least there are a lot of things that are cause for concern about those issues. Now, when I brought those issues up yesterday, whether it was in the show or in the blog, uh, people got irate, and so, of course, as they always do on Daily Coast, <laughs> I, I'm, I now want to write things just to antagonize Daily Coast. Okay, and it's not everybody on Daily Coast. Look, my article went up to the top. A lot of people liked it, and there's a, a million smart people on Daily Coast. But there are some people who are pain on the balls, right? And so they're like, oh, you criticized Obama. Well, we like it up here in his ass. You know? Right? So uh, the one that got to the top was uh, another, somebody else wrote a blog. It was called The Problem with Jank Uger. Oh, no, you didn't. That hurts my feelings. All right, so I don't know anything. I don't know anything. But I think almost everybody would conceive, even the uh, Obama lovers on coast, that uh, Jonathan Turley, law professor at Georgetown, uh, who I believe, or George Washington, who uh, would kick the living crap out of uh, George Bush on a daily basis, and who all the progressives in the country loved because he's really smart, knows his facts, indisputable. Um, well, let's hear from him. Let's see if, he, if he's as uh, you know, uninformed as I am. Let's go to clip number three. The real I interesting issue here is for liberals and civil libertarians that uh, you now have two nominees that ha uh, were selected by President Obama who were more conservative than the people they replaced. Mm. And so Obama is moving the court to the right, something that most people mm. would not have imagined. But also, she is very much a reflection of Obama's views on critical constitutional issues. And those views are not liberal. She uh, supports some of the Bush policies and disagrees with the position of John Paul Stevens. So she may also ultimately undo part of his legacy. But it's not just that area. Uh, civil libertarians are particularly concerned about her writing. She has very little writing, surprisingly right. for an academic. But what she has written trouble civil libertarians in the area of free speech. Now, this was ironic because Sotomayor had the same problem with civil libertarians because she was viewed as having not particularly strong faith in the free speech principles. Kagan seems to take the same view, that if she's willing to compromise free speech in her writings like her 1996 University of Chicago Law Review article. And the interesting thing about all this is that it simply doesn't track in, in the current political debate. There's more of a focus on the third woman on the court, right. another New Yorker. There's not a lot of focus on how she will substantively change the court. And that change seems to be going to the right. Well, hmm. Go ahead. You tell me what I told you yesterday. Okay. Look, for the 88th time, some of these issues that I'm progressive on, she's not progressive on, so that bothers me. Overall, I, judicial moderates are up my alley. It's not about that. It's about Obama's endless urge to go to the so-called center and then sometimes to the right. Now, it's not, Ilana Kagan is not a right winger. She's not Alito. She's not Robert. She's not anywhere close to that. I don't want people getting carried away. But at the same time, out of all the wonderful progressives in the country that you could have chose from, and everybody, so many people made a great case for Diane Wood, who is a real progressive, uh, an undoubted progressive. But that's why Obama's never going to pick her, because he's scared of his own shadow. He's like, oh, my God, somebody might call me a liberal. Okay, I'll, I'll give you Ilana Kagan. She kind of agreed with Bush on executive uh, or power and I, she doesn't like the First Amendment that much. Oh, do you like me now? Do you like me now? No, I don't. And so maybe that plays well in Washington, but I, I find it, all right, I'm going to go calm and say troublesome. Okay? I was going to go with another word. I went with troublesome.
All right, now more from Jonathan Turley if you're still not convinced about Alana Kagan. Clip number four. Well, you know, it's interesting, Jonathan. The Washington Post points out that there are some groups on the left that have criticized Kagan for defending Bush administration policies to seek limits to the rights of Guantanamo Bay detainees and agreeing that terrorism suspects may be detained indefinitely. And that's just one of the points that the Washington Post presents as an issue she may have uh, with those on the left. That's right. And this is not a small part of John Paul Stevens' legacy. He has been a voice of reason. He's been a voice on the court in saying, hold it. You can't adopt different rules for people just because you're afraid of them or you hate them. We have to stand with the principles that define us. Right. That, is, that is John Paul Stevens. Mm -hmm. And that is not Elena Kagan. Oopsie doopsie. Look, it doesn't mean she's a right winger. How many times do I have to say it? But you know what? Here's what I'll tell you specifically what I'm, what I'm worried about. They claim, and, and people like, and smart people, you know, uh, including Professor Lessig from Harvard, okay, they say, no, she's going to pull conservatives to our side. I find that comical, laughable. I dismiss it out of hand. It's not even remotely possible, okay? Uh, now, what I'm afraid of, is that she's just like Obama. That's why Obama picked her. And what's going to happen instead is in order to prove how centrist she is, she's going to get pulled over to the right side every once in a while, to the right wing side. And then she's going to say, oh, look at this. Aren't I such a bridge builder, consensus builder? See, I went over to the right wing side for a number of important decisions. And how many times did they come over to your side? Oh, by then, you'll find out it's flat out zero. You wait 30 years, they're not going to come to your side. And then what do we do? Well, we probably blew a couple of really important decisions on very important things like executive power. So thanks a lot, Obama. really appreciate it. And look, I'm upset about this, but it's more of a question mark because really she has so little on the record, you don't know what she's ultimately going to do. I, I th to be honest with you, I think what's driving my frustration more this week than, than Alana Kagan pick, and I'm, you know, I'm showing that more in Kagan because Kagan's so much more of a bigger story, right? But what's driving my frustration is the Miranda stuff. So, you know, we, I told you about it yesterday, but now absolute confirmation. Uh, Axelrod told CNN that Obama was open to looking at changing the Miranda rule, and he says they continued. There may be some things that have to be done. Certainly, we're willing to talk to Congress about that. And so they're going to change the Miranda rule. Okay, look, a couple things about this. I've said this a million times on the show. I actually don't love the Miranda rule. That's another way that I'm a conservative in some ways on judicial matters. I don't think that's necessarily in the Constitution at all. I think there was a bit of legislating on the part of the Supreme Court. But you have to respect the system. You have to play within the system. You can't pull a Bush and Cheney and say, I don't like the Miranda ruling, so I will now ignore it. Well, the executive branch does not have that within their power. Pretty, no. I mean, at best, you should go to Congress to try to pass a law, okay? But actually, the Supreme Court was pretty clear that Congress, that this was a constitutional issue, and that Congress could not override them. Okay, you want to take it to the court? That's right. That's how you do it. You can take it to the court and say, look, I don't like the Miranda warnings, especially in, you know, terrorist cases or whatever you want to call them. All right, then you litigate it, and that's how you do it. But you don't do it by executive fiat. And so now Obama's saying that, uh, that he wants, quote, limited flexibility on Miranda, and that uh, from now on, uh, he's not going to give them the Miranda warnings uh, for a, quite a while longer as they interrogate them because he's going to use a, quote, public safety exception. Except that public safety exception has never been decided by the courts to apply to anything like this. So what he might do instead is endanger those cases, and we might not be able to convict those people. And I know what the knucklehead conservatives say, oh, who cares about the justice system? Yeah, you take them on the back and shoot them in the head. <laughs> but no, we're not going to do that. We're, you're not going to get any court in the country to take them out in the back and shoot them in the head like Glenn Beck wants you to. Okay? No, what you're going to do is you're going to blow the case. There's a way to do things and, a, and not a way to do things. This is what Bush would do. Go, I don't like the Miranda warnings, so I'm just going to get rid of them. Okay. One, that's totally unacceptable. Number two, the other reason I'm mad at this is, well, then what's the point of defending Obama? You know, because the Republicans and the conservatives make these asinine claims. We go on and we beat them uh, up and we show you how stupid they are. 
And then the very next day, Obama comes out and goes, oh, yeah, yeah, my bad, totally changing. I agree with the Republicans now. Miranda's useless. And I'm not, and, uh, of course, Obama always paints it as middle ground. Uh, you know, uh, I would like to use Miranda sometimes and for some period of time, uh, but I would not like to use it in other cases and for another period of time. So I, I will eventually do Miranda, uh, but according to my own rules that I just made up, so that I can go to my Washington reporter friends and go, aren't I centrist? You see, uh, the liberals want to actually apply the laws as the Supreme Court has interpreted them. <laughs> Rule of law, goddamn libs. And the conservatives say, who cares about the law? Let's rip it up. Let's just ignore the Miranda warnings. Well, I have taken the middle ground and say, I will ignore the Miranda warnings sometimes when I feel like it. Well, that, that won't do. And uh, so when I read this story, I think, why do you ever defend Obama? Because he's just going to change his mind tomorrow, and he's going to go with the knuckleheads. And he's going to think that that was such a clever compromise. So, no, I mean, look, and obviously I don't do it to defend Obama, and if you watch the show at all, you know that very, very well. Uh, I do it because we defend the rule of law, we defend uh, our system, whether it's our justice system, our constitution, our government, as it's supposed to be set up, and we defend progressive ideas. And if Obama's uh, on the other side of that, well, then he's got an ass kicking coming for him. And that's exactly what we intend to do on this program. And guess what? On the Miranda decision that he's made, he doesn't get to make that decision. It is unconstitutional, it is ridiculous, and just as stupid as the Republicans. Now, Obama lovers go crazy and say, oh, no, Jake, you don't understand his genius. And he, according to Obama's genius, you can just ignore the Supreme Court. I know, he's a grand chess player, and he's a master at this. He isn't. He's a, he, he's a guy who's not going to stand up and fight for the positions that he said he was going to. He was very clear on this in the campaign. He said Bush ran roughshod over the Constitution on issues just like this. And then he turns around and he sells out to the Republicans. I'm not a guy who demands no compromises or ideological purity. Okay? But you have to do something you said during your campaign. And these kind of ideological capitulations, let's just say they bother me. Okay? So, uh, Obama 100% wrong, or as I like to say, 1 million percent wrong on this. All right, uh, when we come back, we're going to talk to a conservative. That should be interesting. Young Turks. Back on the Young Turks. Bradley Byrne, goddamn liberal, likes penguins when everybody knows penguins are gay. Guess who else is here? Uh, Anna Kasparian. I am here. Anna Kasparian. I like penguins. Goddamn liberal. <laughs> All right, uh, Anna, mm -hmm. uh, Casper the Friendly Host is here. Uh, we got a fun hour for you guys. Uh, we start with toilets, which is unfortunate. Yes, we do start with toilets and fun facts about India. Turns out that half of India's population uh, have cell phones. Mm -hmm. However, only one-third of India's population uh, can access a decent toilet. Whoa. As my grandma used to say, whoa. Whoa. And then she beat her thighs like this. <laughs> whoa. Man, that's tough, dude. That's like 700 million Indians without a toilet. Yes. Uh, many of them defecate on the streets or uh, in a field basically outdoors where there isn't a toilet. So, of course, there are huge sanitation issues in parts of India, and it's unfortunate. No, yeah, I would, I would definitely describe that as unfortunate. Yes. Uh, I wouldn't call it fortunate. Uh, now, look, here's the thing. You know, people have been going in the fields for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. That's what we originally did. It's not like we had, you know, these luxurious uh, toilets uh, back 300 years ago, 3,000 years ago. You know where you went to the bathroom? You go down the field, and you say... All right, here it is, don't it, right? Now, what India is saying, fair enough, is, look, we've got a, a country that's developing, and we have not yet had an opportunity. It, like, we don't have the resources to build these waste management plants, et cetera, and we don't want to go into debt to build those plants. Right. And you know what? That's not that bad a point. Now, 
at some point, obviously, you're going to have to get a little bit better sanitation. And you know, we an Indian writer wrote this story, uh, Sarita Rai, for the Global Post, and she says, uh, "Look, this is part of what leads to the stereotype that I- India is dirty." But yeah, if you got dudes, you know, taking a dump in the middle of the street, you're going to get that stereotype. Now, uh, of course, not all of India is like that. You go to the major cities, a lot of the major cities, and and some of the. Uh, top places in the world are in India. Okay, so I don't want people getting the wrong ideas, etc. It's just a matter of development and and they just haven't, you know, gotten there in some ways. But what right. is interesting about this story uh is that uh they they're like cell phones. That's important. Right. You know, we take a dump in the backyard, that's fine. Who cares, right? Work in toilet. Not my business, but I need to I need to text my bitch. Well, we're social <laughs> beings and communication means everything to us. So I uh-huh. can understand that. And look, if I never mind, I'm not going to go there. But cell phones are important. There. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, right, right. oh, now I so, w- w- Would you rather? Would look, you look, rather look. work in toilet? If, I, or if, a cell if phone? someone told me, okay, you're going to go live in uh, this country for a year, and you have the choice between a cell phone or pooping in a hole. I poop in a hole. Okay. <laughs> I went there. Sorry. Uh, you went. You went there. So, all right. I color you Indian. No, but the sanitation is obviously a huge issue. And another aspect of this story that's super interesting is the fact that um, NGOs are having a hard time convincing uh, rural communities to use toilets, right? Yeah. Because they're not used to it. They and, and to be and that's exactly right. But and also to be fair. Uh, they put in some money in building the toilet, but they don't put a lot of money in maintaining the toilet. So that's why they become unusable rather quickly. Right. Now, if you had the choice between a toilet that isn't really working and has built up, you know, or going in the field, yeah, I'd go in the field too. So, I mean, keep it real. So what they're trying to do is spend more money per toilet so that they actually have tile and, and functioning water, etc. So people will get encouraged to use toilets. Now, the reason why that's really, really important, of course, is because... Um, sanitation is enormously important to health, right? And then that affects, uh, you know, childbirth. That affects uh, just about everything across the board. That's why people are pushing in that direction. Even giving out micro loans for toilets, mm-hmm. which is kind of cool. You know, and this isn't just an issue in India either. What's interesting is uh, the other day I was watching an episode of Andrew Zimmern, and he traveled to Cambodia, and he was in this little fishing village, and uh, in the village everybody had a cell phone except they didn't have clean water, okay? Mm -hmm. They didn't have some sort of, uh, they didn't have toilets or they didn't have a sanitary way to uh, get rid of their waste, right? So all of their waste went into the water. And in the episode, uh, he's about to eat fish that's being prepared by a woman who lives in this town. And uh, she's washing the fish in the dirty water. And you can see poop floating around, okay? So this is an issue in many other countries, not just India. We got an issue in America, as Bush would say, or or in Cambodia. (laughs) And, of course, this isn't a way to diss any country, okay? These are rural parts of uh, countries, undeveloped parts, and you see it all over the world. Yeah, have you ever been to Alabama? (laughs) I'm just messing with you, Alabama, all day long. I'm going to keep busting you up. (laughs) Bradley Byrne, a goddamn liberal, goes to the bathroom in a toilet. (laughs) Liberal. Okay. All right. Listen, listen, listen. Uh, I cannot leave this Indian story without doing an Indian accent. Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> okay. So, and the great debate between toilet and cell phone. Well, on the one hand, I would like to take a boop in comfort. On the other hand, the ma- bitch has been mad blowing up my phone. So, you know, it's a tough call. I go with cell phone. Call me, baby. <laughs> <laughs> All right. My bad. Okay. You know, I... Oh, my God. I am totally, 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 totally sorry for that. You know what, though? <laughs> Lately, I definitely prefer Tim Hardaway. I think the way he says is killing me. I regret it. I'm and sorry. Me. I'm sorry. That was just my mistake and my, my bad. Man. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I love it with you. <laughs> my fault. I regret it. <laughs> it's just my mistake and my bad. I'm it's sorry. It's just my mistake and my bad. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Keep it going. All right. Uh, Facebook has been in the news recently, and the reason why is because they are compromising our security once again. Yeah, our they're... privacy mm-hmm. and our security. Uh, so, a lot of people are now going to Google and they are searching, "How can I permanently delete my Facebook page?" Whoa, whoa, whoa! So, why do people want to delete their Facebook? 
Facebook has just created a new feature known as connections, right? So on Facebook, you have your wall and you have uh, your info, your profile, right? And in your profile, you get to write what your interests are. So for example, my interests are hiking, running, debating, stuff like that, right? Wait a minute, wait a minute. You're a girl. Shouldn't your interest be uh, walking on the beach uh, on, you know, while the sun is setting? Picnics, the ballet. <laughs> Actually, Am I being as stereotypical? Am I being an ass? A little bit, yeah. Oh, is that right? Okay. Well, then, you know what? Yeah, I regret it. I'm sorry. <laughs> saying I'm sorry. That was just my mistake and my bad. My I'm sorry. My mistake and my bad. And I'm sorry. <laughs> and I'm sorry. But you do like ballet, right? I do like ballet. I haven't uh, put that in my interests. But anyway, so uh, you list your interests, and now Facebook has this feature that connects your interests, links your interests to a, another Facebook page, right? Mm -hmm. Now, why is this such a big deal? Right. What's happening now is all of your interests are no longer private. Okay? Hmm. All of your interests are public. And even if you change the visibility of your interests, people can still find it by doing internet searches. All right, now that is important. And you remember, I'm a little grandpa jank on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Although our Facebook page, Young Turks fan page, is blowing the hell up. It okay? is blowing up. Just, you should look into it. I'm not saying anything. I'm just saying. But seriously, uh, you know what? I get wall post interests. I get a little grandpa jank. And I'm like, mm -hmm. what, what, should I put it on my wall or should I post it? God, I'm so confused, right? So it, it, break it down for me. So why does it matter that people know my interests? My, okay, my interests are rotis and poker. Okay, so well, right. they know it. So what? I mean, for you, maybe that's not a big deal. But maybe people, I, I mean, I don't need everybody knowing what my specific interests are. That's, for me, it's kind of personal. I just want my personal friends to know what my interests are. Mm -hmm. And also, here's another thing that's happening, okay? So uh, you also get to list what type of music you like, what kind of bands you like. Um, an example of a band that I like is Silver Sun Pickups, right? Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, I see Silver Sun Pickup updates, status updates on my homepage. Right. And I'm like, wait, I'm not following Silver Sun Pickups. Why am I seeing their updates on my homepage? So Facebook is using all this personal information to do certain types of marketing. Yeah. And it's making people extremely uncomfortable. And another thing to keep in mind is, let's say you have an interest, right? And uh, you decide, OK, I want to delete these interests because I don't want everybody knowing what my personal business is, right? If you delete it, Facebook still keeps that information. It could still be found on search engines. So this is why people are becoming extremely uncomfortable, and this is why people want to permanently delete their Facebook pages. Okay, uh, so I'm beginning to get it. First of all, if one of your interests is uh, body pillows, mm -hmm. you know, like I like to rub up against body <laughs> pillows and such, well, then, you know, that's a little uncomfortable for the whole world to know that. You just wanted your close body pillow friends to know that exactly. on Facebook, but you didn't want everybody to know it. Right. Number two, yeah, obviously they're using it for marketing purposes. It's a little problem. Like, uh, you know what I got on Facebook the other day? Hmm. Uh, advertisement for Chiquita Moose. Are you serious? <laughs> chiquita, Chiquita, <laughs> Chiquita Moose. Okay, no, all right. <laughs> I didn't, but, <laughs> but you see my point. Yes, I do. Uh, and look, here's the thing. Facebook has to walk a fine line. Uh, they got to make money. Everybody gets that they got to make money, okay? Uh, and... Uh, but they can't do it in a way that's going to freak everybody out. You can't wake people out and get into too much into people's personal uh, stuff. And whether it's your interests or whatever else that they're putting out there that you didn't agree should be public, well, that's a bad business idea because now people are going to start leaving. That's the only thing that could really stop Facebook is a dumb decision like that because it's a colossus now. Yes. But you remember how big MySpace used to be until Rupert Burdock bought it and was like, oh, I'm going to make money off it. Ah. Except he didn't. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. That didn't work out for you. Right. Um, so Facebook's got to be real careful here, man. If I was them, I'd start to walk it back. And here's the thing. Honestly, they should do ads. And mm -hmm. I know they're trying to uh, target the ads according to people's interests, etc. Just calm down and do some regular ads. And people get it. I think people get it. It's mm -hmm. not like you could run this billion dollar enterprise without making any money. But when you, you start picking out, oh, Anna likes, you know, purple dresses, and then you know what else she likes, uh -huh. then okay, people get uncomfortable. Yeah, and let me give you uh, an example of something that was embarrassing for me, right? And now it's on the internet, and I don't know if it'll ever be erased or whatever. So there was this one page on Facebook that I thought was hilarious, and I decided to uh, like it. And when mm -hmm. you know you like it, everybody can see that you like it. And the Facebook page was uh, Kim Kardashian's ass. There was a Facebook page dedicated to her ass. I thought that was hilarious. How could I not like that? So I liked it, 
And now everyone, whether they're my friend or not, can see that. And I deleted it, but according to a lot of uh, tech reports, that information is still out there. Through search engines, you can still find so that information. So if you, you, know, you go on Google and you search, who likes Kim Kardashian's ass, Casper's going to come out. And that's Bye. not right. Casper didn't you want you to know how much he likes Kasparian. <laughs> I'm sorry, Kardashian's ass. But you you always got to think of the information you put out there in terms of future employers, right? Like I'm not saying anything. But like in the future, <laughs> if an employer Google's my name, I don't want them knowing that one day I decided to like Kim Kardashian's ass. I don't know if you know this, but our show is public. I know. Okay, so they might know a lot of things about you, partly what you just admitted. I know. So next interview, they're like, so you like hiking and Kardashian's ass. I know, I know. <laughs> okay. No, I hear you, but of course, we're in a different situation with different uh, uh, jobs. But for most people, that makes them very uncomfortable, very understandably so. Mm -hmm. Okay, Facebook, put some thought behind that. That's not the way to go. All right, let's get to a serious story. Okay. All right. Uh, there was a firebomb thrown into a marijuana store in Montana. It cost about $2,500 uh, in damage. And, of course, this, is, this has to do with the whole marijuana debate. Mm -hmm. In Montana, um, in a particular part known as Billings, they're about to vote on ways to regulate marijuana shops okay mm -hmm. uh, they're worried about marijuana shops being too close to schools they're thinking about uh, a six-month moratorium on new medical marijuana dispensaries or businesses so uh, things are getting a little heated between those who uh, are opposing regulating marijuana or legalizing marijuana and those who do want to legalize it you know you can't help but uh, accidentally say things uh, that related to fire you know, you said things are getting a little heated. They threw a Molotov cocktail through the window, right? Uh -huh. The guy, uh, one of the guys involved in the story said, uh, I'm sure they're trying to fuel the fire about the vote. <laughs> okay, I, I, okay, but don't, don't. They threw a Molotov cocktail, okay? Mm -hmm. They obviously caused a lot of damage, but uh, luckily no one got hurt. Uh, and it's, you know, they scrolled on the window uh, in an earlier incident, not in our town. Right. Okay, what? Do nobody gets a smoke pot in our town. Our town is totally somber and morose. We're downers. <laughs> We're not uppers. Well, actually, neither is marijuana. But nonetheless, okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, they're really mad about about the whole uh, pot thing. But it's just a couple of kids. They caught them on a security camera. Yeah. I thought it was going to be like old timers, like eighty year old like uh, miners from Montana, and like ah oh, no, we drink whiskey around here. We don't know do no pot. But it turns out it's like young kids who are worked up. Right. These young kids probably smoke pot on their free time anyway. Yeah, they're probably <laughs> doing it. They probably lit up before they went. Uh, <laughs> bullshit, man. Not in our town. We used to smoke <laughs> pot in the next town over. Okay, so, uh, look, look, don't, don't go after the marijuana pe uh, things. What are you going to do? They're give, give, in this particular case, like 50 guys in town smoke up a little bit, probably mostly for medical reasons, although believe me, I know. Medical marijuana ain't just for medicinal reasons, okay? Everybody's on to that, okay? Right. Uh, but I'm keeping it real. But uh, don't bother the, the store owner who's doing it. And if you don't like it, obviously go up through the laws. And the thing is, if they say, hey, you know what? Uh, we need to zone the, the marijuana stores a little bit better, and we need to regulate how they advertise, I have no problems with that. We regulate how tobacco advertises. So mm -hmm. no problem with that. Just leave the Molotov cocktails at home. And, you know, we're libs. We're in favor of regulation. Have at it, Hoss, as long as it's legal. Right. By the way, uh, fun tidbits of information. Montana has about 15,000 medical marijuana users. In the whole right? state. Right? In the whole state. And also, they have 5,000 caregivers. And caregivers are those who uh, actually give or sell the marijuana. Um, and then also, the state has approximately uh, 15,000 patients. Back in uh, 2008, they only had 800. So there's been a boom in pot smoking. Yeah, it, it ain't got nothing to do with medicine. Let's keep it real. Let's keep it real, okay? Before, like, people trying to figure out, like, 800 people got cancer such, and they're like, okay, da da, -da. Mm -hmm. Then they're like, make it legal. They're like, oh, yeah, yeah, totally. No. Medicinal. Move it along. Come on, come on. 15,000. Look, in California now, everybody's got pot. Like, you're walking around. You got pot? Of course I got pot. Medicinal. What are you talking about? <laughs> okay, and look, I told you this, right? Like, some conservatives say, oh, no, if you make the medicinal, and then everybody's going to smoke it. And I said, that's right. <laughs> okay, and there's nothing wrong with that. Okay, just keep it real. It's like sometimes conservatives will argue, oh, if we do this, like, I think we're going to get the Raquel Welsh story, right? Mm -hmm. 
and then they, people will have more sex. And then libs will say, no, that's not true. And I say, no, no, it is true. But that's a good thing. So what? <laughs> okay. I'm just trying to, that's all I do on this program, man. <laughs> you just tell you know, the truth. If I had a job title, it'd be keeping it real guy. Okay. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Listen, we got to take a break. Everybody calm down. We'll be right back. All right, back on the air, Turks. Jenkin, Casper, the friendly host. Uh, we've got a lot of great stories for you guys. Uh, a little bit later, uh, the top ten hottest women, according to Maxim, uh, we are going to have significant disagreement. Okay, that's what's going to happen. So you have that to look forward to. Mm -hmm. Controversy written all over. Okay, go. All right, last week we talked about Lawrence Taylor and how he was accused of having sex with a 16-year-old uh, girl who was pimped out to him. The girl had a black eye and it, uh, sh it, it, she was physically abused. And uh, Lawrence Taylor has admit that he did pay $300 to have sexual relations with her. He claims that uh, he was told that she was 19 and he did not know that she was 16 years old. However, in the complaint filed against him, uh, it is alleged that sh he gave her ecstasy and that um, he used uh, violence uh, to force her into having sex. No. Uh, sorry. Uh, Rashid Davis, the pimp, gave her ecstasy and used violence. Oh. So that's a very, very important distinction. So the question is going to be for LT, and a very important question, uh, you know, t twofold. One, uh, sh you know, did he in fact think she was 19 or did he realize that she was 16? Now, that might not have force in law. That's the tricky part for him. You, it's statutory rape either way. It's your job to find out. Now, I'm not sure I agree with that, uh, but it, it, look, at least in the, for uh, not necessarily in a court of law, but for the rest of us, I think that makes a big difference. If he genuinely thought that she was 19, well, then uh, at least for me, that makes a huge difference. Now, I think he's screwed either way in court on that. Now, to me, the second part, to me is also obviously incredibly critical, which is that was it just the pimp who used the violence or did LT also use violence? Right. Okay, if he used violence uh, to subdue her, well, then you got flat out rape, right? And she's not participating. I mean, she's a runaway, and the pimp beat her up and gave her ecstasy and then sent her in the room with LT. Mm -hmm. So now, if he didn't, if uh, Lawrence Taylor didn't use violence at all and thought she was genuinely 19, he fucked up big time in a lot of ways, you know, prostitute. Uh, et cetera, and, and should have known better. I mean, did she have the black eye already? Right. Okay, but if he knew that she was 16 or he used violence on her or both, well, then that's it. He's done. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's jail t time for a long, long time, and he has it coming. Uh, and look, like I said, legally, he's, he's in a world of hurt either way because, uh, you know, most jurisdictions, and I would be surprised if it wasn't this jurisdiction, uh, it doesn't really matter whether you know she's 16 or not. And so, uh, boy, Lawrence Taylor, uh, enormous damage to himself and obviously enormous damage to this girl. We just don't know how much he knew about it. Okay. But yeah. it might be significant whether it's statutory or violent beat-her-up rape. I'm yeah, that's, those are different crimes. They carry different, uh, you know, sentences. Yes, that's also very, very important. And the jury takes that into account, too. So that's why those developing facts in the case are very important. Uh, and is there a more despicable guy than Rashid Davis in the country? I mean, seriously, you know he served 14 years for manslaughter charges. And he gets out in 08, and he's like, "Oh, I got a great new idea. Why don't I kidnap uh, underage girls, uh, ply them with drugs, beat them up, and then turn them into prostitutes? Real fucking class act this guy is." So maybe if he was in one of those Norwegian jails. This oh. wouldn't have happened. Yeah, yeah. Can you imagine putting him in a Norwegian jail? Do you think he deserves that? Hell look, no. look at the conservative over here. See, I'm thinking maybe if he was in the Norwegian jail for manslaughter, he wouldn't have done this in the first place. She's thinking, oh, you're going to send this son of a bitch to a Norwegian jail. Look, I know that my thoughts on the prison system are uh, contrary to what prisons are really supposed to be for. I don't think prisons should be for rehabilitation. Well, they should be for rehabilitation and punishment. <laughs> like, here's Anna's thoughts on that. Rehabilita rehabilitation, if we can get to it. <laughs> okay. 
but punishment first and foremost. Listen, listen. The most humane form of punishment, okay? I'm not saying torture them. I'm not saying no. put them in isolation no. because no, of their not long Joe hair. But I'm saying, okay, if you raped someone, then you need to do some hard time. All right? And that time needs to be hard. It needs to be hard. <laughs> okay. Just, all right. All right. Okay. I'm going to leave it right there. All, all right. right. What's next? Uh, Wikipedia's estranged co-founder, Larry Sanger, is complaining about child pornography on Wikipedia. He claims that Wikimedia, which is uh, a sister site, uh, is distributing child pornography. Okay, So now uh, the other co-founder, uh, James Wales, or sorry, Jimmy Wales, is um, deleting all pornographic images on Wikipedia that do not have any educational value to them. Uh, and I just want to make sure that the pornographic images with educational value remain on. Okay, that's very, very important. <laughs> well, people are complaining about that. People mm -hmm. are saying that uh, there are legitimate pornographic images on there that should not be deleted because they have some sort of educational value to them. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to know how big Jessica Simpson's tits were. I got educated. <laughs> we're, we're, okay, so <laughs> where's the downside? Okay, now, I, I, look, this is a real problem for the wiki people. Okay. Yes. Because if you allow, uh, I was going to say guys, and it's mainly guys, to go and, and change things, what are they going to change it to? In the beginning, it's going to work out nicely. you got a little democratic utopia thing going on. Then eventually, here comes the porn, right? <laughs> and a lot of wise asses running around the country. Like, How do you get wise asses? Why is this? Is this CBS? I want to put on, like, tits and bush. <laughs> yeah. And look, I don't even know how it works, but they got they Wikimedia was apparently a wash in porn, and Larry Sanger's obviously got a you know bitter bug man. up, <laughs> yeah, yeah, better man, still got a bug up his ass. So he's like, oh yeah, oh you you think you co-founded it? What about all this porn on there? And so then Jimmy Wales has got to stay up a couple of nights in a row trying to delete all the porn, and he says, look, you know, I tried my best, mm -hmm. but it turns out there's still some more. Of course. And I love it because, of course, Fox jumps on this story, right? Of course. And they start complaining about an early, uh, an early 20th century color illustration of a young girl performing oral sex on an older man. <laughs> no, but you know, what's great about that is that Fox dug through all of Wikimedia. I mean, do you mean Jimmy Wales, the founder, he's like trying to root out everything. He couldn't find it. But Fox dudes, are, they found it. Fox right. dudes are like, oh, no, 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 let's, look, let's dig deeper for the porn. So deep, oh, yeah, there's a girl, there's a young girl illustration to an oral sex. Hold on, hold on. Okay, now let's report it. Okay, everybody, yeah, this is wrong. Uh, I can't believe Wikimedia did this. And tis, 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 don't make me go look for more porn on there. <laughs> okay, and then they found some, like, naked dude with his balls hanging out or something. Yeah. And Sean Hattie took some time with that. And then well, after, that... he was, like, a very interested, very interested. All of a sudden, he lost all interest and he turned it in. Right. <laughs> well, they had a point with the 16-year-old boy with his genitals hanging out. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But and the color illustration, like, how do you know it's a young girl in the color illustration? Uh, ask like, the Fox News reporters who've been reporting right. on it all day long. Okay, look, here's the thing. Is, should you have the porn on there? No. Are they doing their best to get the porn out? Yes. So what else do you want them to do? Shut down the site because some guy put up a picture of somebody's balls? Sanger wants them to, probably. <laughs> yeah, no, not buying it. Look, they have a responsibility to do the best they can. And, and so, they, so somebody should keep them on their toes on that. Don't get me wrong. And then after a certain point, you let it go, okay? Uh, my guess is Fox News is going to keep coming back to the story. Gee, I wonder why. <laughs> okay, think about it. All right, what's next? All right, USA Today uh, recently did a story about uh, Jackson, Mississippi, and how overweight the people are there. Okay, look, we've talked about this before. Uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention say that Mississippi is by far the most obese state in the United States. But now I have statistics that will blow your mind. Are you ready for them? <laughs> I'm, I'm, okay, hold on, let me see. Yeah, okay, go ahead. <laughs> okay, all right, so one third of applicants for the Jackson, Mississippi Police Department uh, cannot pass the fitness test, okay? And it, it doesn't necessarily mean it, that it's because they're overweight. I mean, of course, some of them are overweight. Others just aren't physically fit enough to pass the agility tests and, uh, the very basic uh, fitness requirements that are necessary to enter the police force. Mm -hmm. Okay, and let me just give you an example of what the test is. The test is push-ups. I'm not exactly sure how many, and a lot of them can't run the one and a half mile that's required of them. That's amazing. Uh, you know what? I'm actually not that amazed by that. I got to be honest with you. A mile and a half? 
Yeah, yeah. Have, have you ever been to Mississippi? <laughs> okay. And look, it would be unfair to Mississippi. Have you been to a lot of towns in this country? Right. I mean, we're all obese, right? So a third of the town, uh, people, now the thing is, these are guys that are applying for the police and fire department. Yes. I mean, they're not even the guy sitting on his couch, and they can't run a mile and a half. You know what? I'm a bad guy, but I'd like to be there at, uh, you know, when they're doing the tests. <laughs> like, oh, oh, oh. All right, fuck it, I give up. <laughs> no, but, but if you're going to be a fireman or a cop, come on. You can't, obviously you got to run a mile and a half. So okay. at least in the beginning, then you eat the donuts, then you'll be all right. All right, get ready for this next stat. Just get ready for it, okay? 77% of fire and emergency tech trainees in Massachusetts are either obese or overweight. 77%. That's I amazing. I wasn't ready for it. It blew me away. Uh, no, once again, totally not surprised. Be partly because, first of all, that's Massachusetts, not Mississippi, right? Um, yeah, you're right, Massachusetts. My okay, bad. So, My bad, no, right. I'm sorry. So it's not just uh, you know, the conservatives in the South. It's also the libs up in Massachusetts, okay? So we're fat everywhere. Uh, so, and, and the thing there is, yeah, it's because they change the standards. You know, if, if, look, part of it is because we're actually a Roy. Part of it is that they change the standards, and if you're not like, if you don't have a six pack, they consider you overweight. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh my God, you're 5'9 and 150? Oh, uh, morbidly obese. <laughs> you're like, wait, wait, what do you mean? I have what, how, how do, why? Mm -hmm. So I don't believe the numbers that much. That's part of the problem. Nice. And by the way, look at my lib ass, right? When it's Mississippi, I believe it, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. When it's Massachusetts, all of a sudden, you don't believe it. Mm -hmm. Okay, anyway, keep it going. All right, uh, last stat. In localized studies, uh, researchers find consistently that at least three-fourths of uh, police and firefighters are overweight. Three-fourths? Three-fourths. One-third are obese. Mm -hmm. Okay, look, look, I got a huge bias here. That's why I'm, I'm not buying this story. No, I see what you're saying about the numbers. Like, if I go to the doctor, he'll tell me, oh, you need to lose 15 pounds. Like, you, it's crazy. Like, the requirements are crazy. No, 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 she's not crazy. The doctor is. Okay, now I'm playing. I'm playing. Mm. <laughs> no, I'm playing. I'm playing. No, no, seriously, the doctor says I'm obese. Okay. Obese? Obese. I'm Man. like, dude, look, first of all, Let's get, get your ass on the track. I bet I fucking murder you in a one-mile run. So don't save me your obese bullshit. Okay? I believe it. <laughs> okay. Now, the, and, and I would pass all these tests in flying colors. And the guy, at least in the article, made that distinction. He's like, some people pass the fitness test but are considered overweight anyway. And some people are not considered overweight but don't pass the fitness test. So I know those two different things. But uh, nonetheless, uh, they're calling everybody obese now. And, yeah, look, I got a huge gut. I say it all the time, right? But obese, that's a bit much. Right. Because they, like, they, uh, one last thing. I'm, t now, I'm a bitter man <laughs> on this, okay. He, they think that everybody who's the same height should be the same weight. Right, they don't I mean, take... it's such a, it's not, they don't do these measurements with a scalpel, they do them with a hatchet. So they're like, okay, if you're 5'9", well then, you know, you need to be 160 or something. And so when I come out at 230, they're like, Jesus Christ! You're like the most obese guy that's ever lived. You sure you're not having a heart attack right now? Well, dude, my body ain't the same as, you know, Dave's body or Ben's body. Ben's like 5'9", right? I think he might even be 5'10". Do Ben and I have the same body? Right. No, I mean, we have totally different body types. I have thick bones. That's exactly what I was about to say. <laughs> Jake has big bones. <laughs> that's always the excuse. Now, it ain't about the bones, but you have different body structures, of course. Mm -hmm. It's ridiculous. All right, that's my rant of the day on obesity. Don't get me wrong, still, you know, as my old friend used to say when I asked him about metabolism, no, 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 here's it, shut your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get carried away, oh, I got thick bones, and then go eat like three pies, mm -hmm. right? Bounds of reason. That's, that's what we push on the show. They call us libs, but in fact, we're all about moderation. Absolutely. All right. Give me one more. All right. Uh, the 1970s sex symbol Raquel Welsh uh, claims that the pill has uh, ruined the institution of marriage. Basically, she says that it allows women to be promiscuous mm. and go out and have sex without worrying about getting mm. pregnant, and because of that, they're less likely to want a committed relationship. Don't it. Damn, she looks real good. No, no, well, here's what you're failing to understand. Raquel Welch is one of the hottest women to ever live. Right, I know that. Okay, she's in my top five of all time. Think about it. That is a very serious ranking, okay? 
We don't just throw that around around here, okay? Sophia Loren, Raquel Welch. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now I'm going to give her, since I'm a little biased in favor of her, uh, I'm going to give her a little slack. And why are you going to give her slack? No, no, no. And I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you why. And it's not because of my bias. Mm -hmm. um, because at first when I read the headline and I started reading into the story, and she's like, oh, they're too promiscuous. Right? I'm like, y what are you talking about? You were a sex object. I mean, you were... That's she was married three times. I mean, you're going to talk about the institution of marriage. And, and you took pictures like this where we could basically see your boobies. And, you know, and, and <laughs> I mean, men have gone to work on you over decades. Where and, are our morals? Yeah, and where were your morals when you were showing me your babanis, right? <laughs> okay. But the reason I'm cutting her some slack is because she admits that later. Mm -hmm. Okay, in the interview, she says, look, look, look. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I know. I was a sex object, da da da, da da da. So she's like, now, if I think we've gone overboard, you might begin to get a sense of, hey, maybe we went overboard. Mm -hmm. So when she framed it that way, then I was like, you know, Raquel, I might pardon you because mm -hmm. I am merciful, right? And so, so that's a little bit better way of putting it. And look, there's some truth to it, too. Think about it. Because of birth control uh, pills, are more people having sex knowing that they're not going to get pregnant? Of course, of course they are. Right. Now, the thing is, you know, here, she's 69 now, and, you know, you get a little older and you get a little bit more judgmental sometimes, and there I'm not cutting her as much slack. So now, now that, she, you know, her time is done, and she apparently hooked up with, like, every guy in Hollywood, let's keep that in mind, too. Mm -hmm. Not only three marriages, but known to have been with almost all the top actors. Okay, keep it real, Raquel. Now that she's done, though, she's like, wow, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right, all right. So... Now, no, but the difference between Raquel Vel Welch and I, and those differences are vast, <laughs> <laughs> but in this particular case, is that I think, yes, m more people are having sex. She's right. And there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Now, it, it's not as good if you have unprotected sex and, you know, you get pregnant, unwanted pregnancies, etc. Well, that's the downside. But you see, I would then say the real question is, you know, are you protecting yourself? Make sure you don't get sick. Make sure you don't get pregnant. But outside of that, if you're, you know, having sex outside of marriage, well, that's what Raquel Welch did. <laughs> and, uh, and that's what a lot of people do. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I mean, people are getting married in their 30s and 40s now. What are you supposed to do? Wait till you're 38? No, Raquel Welch told me I'm being too immoral. Uh, I got to hold on. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> okay, no, it's not a good idea. Let it go. It's all right. We got the birth control pill now. The mm -hmm. of, uh, wonders of modern science. Okay? So go forward. That's what I say. All right. All right. Time for another quick break. We'll be right back.